because um, wrongly, in my view, very wrongly, in my view, um, some people in the uh, office of Keir Starmer saw this um, uh, proposal uh, as being a first step towards freedom of movement. Uh, the Labour Party thought it had to demonstrate its lack of enthusiasm very outspokenly. And then the government, the British government, the Conservative government had to row in behind them. Um, Starmer is very concerned not to be seen by the right wing press, by the, the Red Wall or whoever, however you like to put it, as being too pro-European. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust. And I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in the UK relating to Brexit. Brendan, we've had an offer from the European Commission on uh, freedom of movement um, in the sense that they are indicating the possibility that Britain might enjoy uh, a an exchange arrangement for younger people. Um, what precisely is this proposal? Well, it's a proposal at the moment, um, not to the British government, to the but to the Council of Ministers of the European Union. It's not yet an offer from the EU. It may well be that the ministers change this offer proposed by the Commission. What the Commission are proposing is not really freedom of movement. It's a, a very limited and specific arrangement whereby it will be easier for people up to the age of 30 to work and study, not throughout the European Union, but in one country of the European Union. So those people who say it's a, a backdoor to freedom of movement, whether positively or negatively in their own view, um, are, are misrepresenting it, I think. And why do you think the Commission has made this um, suggestion now? I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, one, because the present permission, commission is coming to an end of its tenure and wants to clear up uh, unfinished business. Two, uh, I think that they, they know that the British government wants to approach uh, for bilateral agreements various other countries of the European Union. Um, and it's eager that there shouldn't be a, a patchwork of arrangements, of uh, bilateral arrangements between the UK and, say, France and Germany and Italy, and nothing similarly with Bulgaria or, or Romania. It, it is the ta task of the European Commission to bring some sort of consistency and solidarity within the European Union. Uh, and three, I, I think they, they may have thought that they were giving an example to the Labour Party, to an incoming Labour government, of the possible benefits of a, of a closer and less contentious relationship with the European Union. Presumably, they also see some advantages for uh, the EU and for its individual member states, because obviously there is a demand for labour in all developed economies and younger people uh, coming into the European Union for a period um, to work or to study is an advantage for them, too. Well, it's perfectly reasonable that the European Commission should have the advantage of the European Union um, uh, at the forefront of its mind. There, there's been a certain amount of criticism in this country of, uh, of uh, maximalist demands from the European Union, from insensitivity to the political needs, supposed needs of the Labour Party. Um, but I, I think that's, um, that, that's misplaced. It, it's up to the European Commission to represent European interests. And, and I'm sure they have that at least partly in mind in, in the proposal they've put forward. But it's important to note that this isn't the final proposal. Um, there would be there would be negotiations um, on this subject, and who knows what the final text would look like, even if it did get to an, the question of negotiations between the British and the EU side. And how did the British government react to this story? Well, well, initially it, it took what, what was a rather rational reaction. And there are suggestions that, that um, informal negotiations have been going on in Brussels uh, uh, on this subject. And uh, its initial reaction was to say, uh, well, we're all in favour of doing what can we, can we can to help young people study and, and work abroad. Um, let's see what the final text looks like. And then they were rather upstaged by, by the Labour Party, who, who went much further in its rejection. But do you think that there is room in Conservative thinking for, for going down this path? Um, I think there might have been, but I think not now, because the Labour Party equated this wrongly, in my view, uh, with the first step towards freedom of movement. Um, and once that had been said, the Conservative Party uh, had no way back. Uh, it had to say that what it proposes now, what it favours now, is a uh, 
is a series of bilateral arrangements with um, individual European countries. Uh, that's always been the hope of the Conservative Party, that if they ignore the institutions of the European Union, somehow they'll come to, to better uh, individual or bilateral arrangements with, um, with member states. It, it's, a, it, it's a delusion. It's the belief that if you ignore the European institutions hard enough, they'll go away. And it's, it's never worked that way. But the Labour Party's reaction is slightly surprising, perhaps, given the uh, noises that have certainly been made by uh, various leading spokesmen. I'm thinking of uh, Mr. Lammy in particular, um, in favour of some form of closer engagement with the EU over time. How do you see this? There was a particular uh, Financial Times article uh, uh, about what they described, or what presumably the Labour Party described, um, as a, a twin-track approach um, of having its red lines of no customs union, no single market, no freedom of movement, um, but being a, a more open and flexible on, on the other side of the equation, say on, on defence and foreign policy, environmental questions. Um, I think that because, um, wrongly in my view, very wrongly in my view, um, some people in the uh, office of Keir Starmer saw this um, uh, proposal uh, as being a first step towards freedom of movement. Uh, the Labour Party thought it had to to demonstrate its lack of enthusiasm very outspokenly. And then the government, the British government, the Conservative government had to row in behind them. Um, Starmer is very concerned not to be seen by the right wing press, by the, the Red Wall or whoever, however you like to put it, as being too pro-European. And he normally interprets that as meaning that he has to be almost as Eurosceptic as the Conservative Party. Well, ironically, in this case, I think he's proved himself a, a little bit more Eurosceptic than the Conservative Party, and they've had to row in behind him. But if this were to be actually implemented um, after a, a, a UK general election with perhaps a Labour government, they were to go ahead with this, would it actually in reality constitute a step towards freedom of movement? And what would its impact be? Well, I, I think it would be so far from freedom of movement that um, people who are in favour of it or against it on the basis of its um, contributing to freedom of movement are, are, are on the wrong are on the wrong um, path entirely. It's only to one country. It's only for four years. It's for a limited number of people. Mm. The philosophy of freedom of movement is something quite different from what we're talking about here. Uh, and I think it, it's ironic that we have a, a, a European debate in this country where pe some people are in favour of this proposal because it's a first step towards freedom of movement, and some people are against it because it's a first step towards freedom of movement. Um, and, and both of them are wrong, in my view. But surely having some uh, EU nationals coming into the UK and able, presumably, to take jobs um, would have some impact on the overall pattern of, uh, of of immigration, which we're now having largely from outside Europe um, to fill the jobs that are, are needed uh, by um, foreign workers in our economy. Um, I mean, is there some issue here, which was a feature, I think, in the referendum campaign between whether we were taking immigration from Europe or from more broadly, more internationally, globally, this contrast between the global British idea and the European Britain? I, I think most people in the Labour Party know uh, that there is no rational ground for its uh, ideological hostility to freedom of movement. Um, there was a hint in, in one of the press briefings that seems to have taken place to the FT um, that this movement, this proposal, was not really freedom of movement, but could be presented as such. Um, I, I think it might well have the beneficial um, uh, effects that you're talking about. Um, but uh, as long as both um, the Conservative and Labour parties are hooked up on this idea that freedom of movement is, is an absolute evil, something which is politically uh, unacceptable to the United Kingdom, um, any changes um, along these lines proposed by the Commission's um, suggestions go, can only be very marginal. But why are they so hooked up on freedom of movement? Because they've convinced themselves um, that that was what determined uh, the Red Wall, as they see it, to vote against Brexit. Uh, they vote in favour of Brexit, to vote against remaining in the European Union. Uh, the, the, the idea um, that uh, 
people who are economically struggling, uh, who are finding it very difficult to get jobs, um, could look at supposedly um, Polish, Romanian immigrants and say those are the people who have taken our jobs um, was something that, that, that weighed very heavily, particularly with the Labour Party. And um, they, they, they show no signs of wanting to emancipate themselves from what I regard as this, uh, as this, uh, this unnecessary and uh, largely fantastic nightmare. But the impact of our leaving the European Union has been simply to uh, shift the pattern of our immigration for uh, people coming to work and filling the jobs that are required by uh, our economy um, from being EU citizens, essentially, to being non-EU citizens. I mean, it hasn't actually changed the numbers at all. In fact, in, in some respects, it's actually increased the numbers, possibly. Um, isn't this rather a strange situation that it is the the European Union dimension that has been foco the focus of attention in this debate rather than the broader one? It, it, it is yet another of the paradoxes of Brexit. Everything... Um, that is a logical consequence of Brexit and leads to a paradox. Um, the question is how long these paradoxes can continue. And they have managed to continue rather longer than, than you or I might have expected. That's because we've had a conservative government. That's because we have a, a, a press um, background and to some extent uh, uh, another me the rest of the media background, um, which takes um, for granted the idea that um, freedom of movement, European freedom of movement, is in some way something undesirable politically and socially for the country. Uh, my own view is that when we have a, a Labour government, even one that um, starts from the starting position that it does of rejection of freedom and freedom of movement, it'll be much difficult for it to live, live indefinitely with these paradoxes than it's been for the, the present Conservative government. I suppose one fear uh, from the UK point of view might be that if they start down this path, um, they will find an asymmetric attraction that the EU will um, be a, a, an attractive proposition for many younger people from the UK a, a benefiting from a scheme of this kind. And this might lead to a brain drain from the UK. Uh, I think that is possible, but I doubt whether it's a, a, a worry of, of the, the Brexiteers, as it were, um, who dominate the Conservative government at the moment. Uh, one of the reasons why the, the British government finds it so difficult to mitigate um, the dangers and difficulties of, um, of Brexit is that psychologically it can't face up to those dangers and difficulties because it, they have to convince themselves that Brexit is going well. They can't tell themselves that the, the entirely predictable problems of Brexit uh, are now coming to the fore and need mitigation. That's uh, another reason, it seems to me, why the Conservatives in particular uh, find it difficult to uh, um, to confront uh, any any rational proposals for lessening the damage of, um, uh, of Brexit. We, we do not consider the damage of, of Brexit. It does not exist. That's very much the Brexit mindset. The, the asymmetry of making just partial steps closer to the EU does bring to the fore the, the more fundamental argument. You know, is the route back? Uh, one that requires making the case for a complete rejoining of the European Union? Or is it, um, re is it feasible to have a sort of piecemeal step-by-step -step approach, which um, this matter um, is one instance of? I think on the contrary, um, it, it, uh, the the, um, the second possibility is disproved and, and, and qualified by, by what's happened over the past week. Um, there are always going to be so many issues and so many uh, uncertainties surrounding these sectoral uh, approaches um, that it would be much better to have a, a single overall um, argument and negotiation about rejoining. Um, we might spend three or four years under a new Labour government um, coming to a position uh, where there is a compromise on this very limited issue uh, of youth mobility. Um, but then it will take another four years to do another sector, another 10 years to do yet another sector. Um, it will take a, a, a long, long time. And at some point, the European Union will consider that they are not going to go down the Switzerland road. Um, they will always have a, a, a rather 
hard-headed and rather sceptical view to, as to what constitutes their interests and how that far their interests is, it runs parallel with the United Kingdom. Um, if we are to re rejoin, if we continue to enjoy or enjoy again the benefits of being in the European Union, it seems to me you can't do it on a sectoral basis. You have to do it on the basis of one overarching negotiation to rejoin the European Union. And so the pro-European case in this country has to be made as one to rejoin in full, not to try and do a sort of uh, grandmother's footsteps approach of a uh, bit by bit. I think for a number of reasons, both practical and intellectual and, and ethical, that, that is the only way. Because if we look back um, uh, until the, to, to the years before 2016, we were told that all the opt-outs and all the hesitations and the special, special declarations were the way in which the United Kingdom could be reassured and cajoled into remaining in the European Union. Well, it, it didn't work that way. It was quite the other way around. What happened was that people said to themselves, if it's a good idea to opt out of this, that and the other, perhaps it's a good idea to opt out entirely of the European Union. Um, it's, it's only on the basis of going back into the European Union um, and being full members of the European Union that I think any any coherent case can be made um, in, in the foreseeable future for being in the European Union. Well, that certainly is the position of the Federal Trust. Brendan, many thanks for this. We will continue to do uh, further uh, videos along these lines. And I hope you uh, will follow us in those two. Thank you very much. Goodbye.